Microbit recipes. So, so what's this about? So let me give you some background. First of all, I, I had the pleasure of working on the original Microbit rollout back in 2016, I think it was, uh, um, when we had those millions of Microbits rolling out to schools, um, free to every pupil in um, year eight. Uh, and I worked on the on the program at my, when I was at Microsoft. Um, I had a I had the pleasure of of actually seeing that the first in, in, uh, incantation of of the micro bit, and uh, that's that little blue chip thing there um, before it evolved into its final form. And I worked with a number of teachers on Microsoft's um, Quick Starter Guide for Teachers, and you know that project was a success in certain areas and it wasn't a success in other areas um, and i'm sure you've all got uh, feelings about that but the microbit is here it's it's, it's here with us um, and i think over the the, the past few years uh, it, it's developed into a real key learning tool for students to enter into the world of computing and for teachers especially at primary and key stage three to lead their students into the world of computing so that they can begin thinking about it as a, as a potential career or as an, an exam course for them to, to undertake at GCSE and A-level. So who is this idea for? Well, I've spent a lot of time working with teachers that have no experience of computing or coding. Perhaps they even think that it's not for them. Why should they bother? All of those aspects. Um, teachers with um, very little interest in, in trying to develop um, computing because they just don't see it as for them. They, they're not connected to it. They're not um, uh, engaged with it. They can't see how they can put it into their classroom. There's all these fiddly bits. There's things that they have to load up. There's all this vocabulary that, that they, they don't understand it and it doesn't relate uh, to anything that they, they uh, think about. Um, and I, I'm a great believer in bringing, if we're going to get what we want which is like more students more graduates in the world of computing and computer science we've got to start earlier we've got to get down to those those, those primary students and we've got to carry it on through to case stage three into when they get their choices for exam uh, examinations and the other area it's for it's for the stem ambassador program and for those who don't know the stem ambassador program at stem learning we run uh, work with a number of um, organizations and partners around the UK and we have thousands and thousands of STEM ambassadors who are people from industry who volunteer to go into schools, talk about their careers, talk about careers um, uh, in, in different industries ranging you know, from engineering right the way through to high-end uh, technical computing. The, the, the scope is, is immense and these people will uh, can be utilized in school as volunteers and many of them are running code clubs many of them are working reg regularly with with students in schools and they're bringing to those students their expertise in computing and why we've targeted them that this is another resource to support these teachers who perhaps feel that computing is not for them it's not something they're able to deliver so by combining these three areas we're looking at um, uh, trying to uh, trying to support those teachers uh, with a way into this. If you like, I often called the micro bit that the sort of gateway drug of computing. It's it's what we can get these people started on, but we have to approach it in the right way. So these are my thoughts uh, about how perhaps we could do this. Um, I've based this on a, a program that I ran when I was at Microsoft, which is the, the Code of Cup, which many of you may have engaged with or have, have heard of. And when the same approach was there, it was thinking about low level entry, uh, 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 the least number of hurdles you had to jump to get into that entry and to make it relevant. And this was the key point, relevant to the teacher that was teaching this, especially in primary where those teachers might not be, well, generally aren't computing specialists. So, and they have other, uh, other flavors of the curriculum that they specialize in and are interested in and, and uh, are comfortable with. If we can merge computing into those, then we've got a way of, by which we can um, get more students uh, uh, engage with computing, get more students and teachers uh, implementing our, uh, computing within the classroom. 
and the microbit is a perfect vehicle for that. So the aims of this whole project were to get microbits out of the cupboards. I mean, how many of you listening now, I mean, please put some stuff in the chat, um, have, you know of microbits sat in cupboards, still doing nothing. Um, you, you tried them, you've done something, maybe uh, they're not for you at the moment. Could they be liberated into using with uh, um, other uh, aspects across the school? Um, to support your vision of computing in your school. How many of you are in primary schools and know that there might be microbits sat in the cupboards of your, of, of your secondary schools that are just sat there and ha have done nothing? Um, so one of the things I've been doing recently when talking to groups of primary schools is getting them to contact their secondary school and asking for, for to see if microbits are still around. Of course, there shouldn't be any microbits in the cupboard because we were all supposed to give them to, to our students. but they turned up late and it, we sort of missed, a, 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 a skipped the beat on, on some of those areas. So hence there are many still in cupboards in schools, not doing anything. So part of this program was to liberate those, get them into the hands of the people who, where it's really important and that's into the hands of students. So if you do know of anybody that still has micro bits, then perhaps this might be an, a way of, um, creating a project by which we can start to get those into the hands of, of, of kids in, in primary schools. It's also to introduce the, the teachers to this great cost-effective device. It, it, the micro bit is so cheap relatively. Um, I often hear of teachers saying, well, we're looking to buy a, a, a Lego robotics kit. Well, for in, cost of one robotics kit, you can buy a class set of micro bits. Now, often they don't see the, 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 diff, the, the similarity between the two, the fact that you get the Lego, you get a well-known um, uh, a product like that. How can the micro bit offer the same sort of learning uh, as something uh, that costs 300 pounds? Well, it does because, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about why I feel that, but as we know those people have used the microbit in the classroom. In the hands of students, the, it, the device becomes effective uh, as a piece of Lego. It, it, it opens their imaginations up and their questions and, and their desire to actually create and build something. Also, when you're speaking to a head teacher, asking to spend some money, again, if, if uh, the, the cost of 300 pounds against for a class set, is um, slightly more within reach and maybe not as much as a shock of, of buying lots more of, of these expensive things. And it's expandable. The, the range of extra products now that can be added to the micro bit you know, um, uh, is staggering. Teachers often ask, can I build a robot with it? Yes, is the question. Can I uh, make a data logger out of it? Yes, is the question. You can do that, but the real question is, are they able to do that? So. An investment in microbits for me is, is a wise investment because it's, it's, it's ever expandable. Third thing I'd like, we're looking at is, is computing across the curriculum, STEM orientated subjects um, and, and activities. So that you, you, with the microbit, students and teachers are building something and they're making something, making a final product. And we want them to make that final product with materials that they're familiar with. And I'll be explaining a little bit about that as, as we go through this. And fundamentally want to leave a legacy with the teachers so that if a STEM ambassador comes in to work with the teachers or, uh, or, and to work with those students, when that STEM ambassador is no longer there, that teacher will continue to take that little bit of learning and rehash it, remix it, so that they will keep delivering and repeating those activities to their students and allowing their students to keep hands on with this. I worry sometimes that we send experts in or and STEM ambassadors into these programs and teach some teachers just wait for that to come in, write their computers being delivered, and it'll never happen again until the STEM ambassador or the expert will arrive uh, again uh, this time next year. So it's about leaving that, that legacy for the teachers to engage and to develop their own thinking and um, ideas around the use of uh, microbits and computing. 
and fundamentally it's to give more, stu more students more opportunities to use computing across the curriculum. The f uh, those that know the micro bit, the make code website is very simple to use. There is very little, uh, that, you know, there's very little technical issues about getting this running across your network. Um, I'll put the word iPad in brackets there. There are some issues we're using it on iPads with Bluetooth, etc. But generally, it's, it's very, um, there's a low entry to it to get in it up and working. And the reading levels, the way, um, uh, again, open this up to uh, a lot more students um, and, the, and the functionality of it. They haven't got to remember the commands. They haven't got to remember the syntax. For example, they can uh, literally build their code using the blocks in that Lego fashion. And they can do this very quickly, trying it out and uh, seeing if it works. And then, they're and they get very comfortable with it very quickly. Our STEM ambassador program, we work with our STEM ambassadors and we train them uh, to give them a feel of, of some activities that um, they can utilize when they go in front of a class. I think as teachers, we forget how intimidating a group of nine-year-olds can be to people that are not in that every day. So the STEM ambassador program as an induction program by which all the STEM ambassadors go through, we DBS check all the STEM ambassadors, so we have that level of, of, of um, safeguarding across the program. And the traditional activity we give them is, is the building bridges out of spaghetti. So they problem solving, the kids are given uh, a load of spaghetti, often marshmallows, and asked to build the, 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 the highest tower. Many of you might have seen this or done this, that type of activity yourself. So what I wanted to do with the micro bit is to get the equivalent of the STEM ambassador spaghetti bridge building type activity, something that was very simple for them to pick up, to take in and to work with the teachers on to deliver um, aspects around computing in, in the classroom. And this is my Bible. Um, I, I read this, I've read this book a number of times and you know, those of us that went to teacher training college, we, we all did stuff around Piaget and constructivism. And Seymour Papa and Piaget were, were, were good pals and, and talked a lot about sharing their ideas. And this is something that's sort of steered my thinking, not just about computing, but about the way I approach um, my teaching when I was in the classroom. This idea about small blocks and from those ideas and concepts, students and children can build up the next idea and then they can add to it and they experiment and work from it. And that, uh, quote I've put there that, that, that learning is most effective when the experiences are constructing a meaningful product. And that's something that I think that sometimes is missing from some of the work that we do in computing, that the students are understanding a concept, they can write a bit of code that to understand and demonstrate that concept, but what's the practical meaningful project product that they can build from that, that relates to them, uh, I might add. Um, yeah, we can, uh, kids understand about traffic lights, but do they really relate to their concept and to their world? When maybe another twist on that might be to think about um, uh, a burglar warning light system or, or uh, that's something that is, connects directly into their imagination. But Mindstorms by Seymour Papert, if you've not read it, it's available online apparently now. You can get that this as a download for free. But I, I trolled eBay to get um, my... Uh, a, a, a copy and um, yeah, it, it, it's something that guides my learning and my thinking about how I d deal with um, teaching and learning concepts in the classroom. I strongly recommend that if you can get hold of it and if you haven't read it, have a read. So microbit recipes, I, I, I thought I, it's always nice to have a nice catchy thing and it, it was this idea was what are they? So it was the idea that you could have a simple recipe to follow and then by playing around with the ingredients, if you like, the bits of code, you could build ever more complex and, and um, uh, 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 delicious dishes. Uh, well, that's what my wife tells me that cooking is anyway. I just throw everything in hope for the best. And maybe that's a good approach to computing as well. But I wanted this concept that teachers might understand that a recipe, a list of things, basic things to follow, and then they can elaborate and expand it out to their own tastes and wishes. So what we've I set myself the challenge was to create three simple basic examples of code. And these would be based in some computing concepts upon which 
that they they uh, you could then build something very effectively, but also by tweaking them a little bit and adding little bits of further code to them, you could create even more um, different products. You could create different, more different, further different experiences for students. I wanted to make sure that we were starting to introduce this idea of the, the prim approach for those um, about um, you know, predicting and, and uh, running the programs to get that in as soon as we can, not from a very much of, uh, of a sort of here's a, a very um, rigid approach to this, but certainly starting to in, infer the, the process of PRIM in these activities and give a little bit of vocabulary and guide use it as a guidance for somebody like a STEM ambassador to maybe construct their their session or their lesson for their students. So starting off with some prediction and then modifying and so on and so on. So it, it was very important for me to ensure that we started to get that vocabulary and that structure within these activities. They had to be short and quick to deliver. Um, you know, when you're having somebody in to, to, for, for school, uh, a visit for school, you know, by the time you've done dinner registers and uh, the kids have got to their, the right classrooms and so on, it, it, they, you, you often don't have a lot of time left. So again, the descriptions had to be no more than two sides of A4. So I picked these following concepts um, from computing. The traditional hello world, which is just simple, simply some information, some manipulation of variables, and that's just making a simple counter, and then some Boolean logic. And perhaps I might not use the word Boolean logic, but just some simple logic um, of yes, no, uh, if this has happened and that has happened. Those are the sort of three areas that I wanted to focus on as an introduction to using this um, great little device in the classroom. Then this idea that each activity can be spiced up using addition, uh, additional uh, activities such as inputs. Um, and the one that I've not mentioned in this, but kids always find is the music feature within the micro bit. But so I've purposely left that out and left it as something that perhaps students and teachers might want to, uh, might do, well, they always discover it. Um, and for those of you who have run a, cl a class session of micro bits with the music on through the, the bra uh, browser window, it, it's uh, something to behold and perhaps not something you want to do every time. The noise is absolutely incredible. And then all activities aim to create something. So it's not just the micro bit. Is there something that we can use sort of junk modeling from or my favorite material working with the micro bit, um, aluminium foil? Is there something that we can create for with the students that they can build with it that can sort of um, uh, spread across the curriculum? And I'll explain some of the things we've made across the curriculum, even into in religious education. The micro bit was used to create something. So we're always aiming to create something. And that can come from something directly from the curriculum or from something from the, the, a child's imagination. But it's this physical computing element that we really want to capitalize on in this, uh, these, these activities. So here's my basic recipe, number one. So it's really that students have to make a, a sequence uh, uh, using uh, just experimenting. This allows them to get to grips with the, the, the make code interface. It allows them to experiment and how they all fit together um, and, and just to really to play around. Now, I've put a, a simple loop together here, but many students may show an icon then pause, then show an icon, then pause, then show an icon, then pause. Depends how many they want to put in, to, uh, in in their sequence. And if we give them a context such as, can they tell a story across their micro bit, a joke, even a recipe about making uh, some food using um, not just some the icons they got available or ones they des design themselves. And then you've got things like the traditional flashing heart, sad smiley face. These are things that you can start with. The children get an understanding of how to manipulate these blocks on the screen. And the one key important factor is downloading this from uh, the desktop device or the laptop device to the micro, micro bit. Those people who have done this with students for the first time, 
the sheer joy that you see in young people when they've taken this piece of code that they created on one device and what they expected and predicted that would happen from it appears on this little piece of electronics to the side of them. It's just magical to see. And it just shows the value of that physical experience of being able to take this code and Yes, it runs on, on, on the PC that they've got in front of them. Many children expect that. That's the computer. That's what it does. But when they see that they've been able to take it and put it onto a, a micro bit, and then they can pick the micro bit up and walk around with it, then it's something very special indeed. So this is the very first basic recipe. And it, again, it's like that Hello, the traditional code in Hello world, where you just get something to display. We've worked with teachers to expand this up even further by now spicing it up by adding some inputs, particularly using the buttons on the micro bit. The shake is the most popular and even the, the on pin pressed, which we, uh, we uh, are useful for some of the things we build later on. So now we've gone from just hello world to actually having a piece of code that reacts to an event and again we can put in our, our prim we can ask the students what to predict will happen um what ha they can experiment with each one and again test out these predictions um they come up with problems like how do i get button b to work and then then there's a little bit of teaching there about guiding them about choosing further um elements within each command block but it's fairly quick to do and it's fairly because the questions have come from the teacher themselves because they don't know how to get the b button to work or from the the, the t children themselves we've just kept the sort of learning quite closed but also there's these elements by which they can start to e explore some further aspects of uh, elaboration on their program and when we put these two recipes together and we've spiced it up a little bit, we can create these little things that, um, uh, uh, that if some examples here, you've got the traditional hello, but let's put it into a card um, so, or a badge, or um, there's a really great, um, some templates to create little cardboard uh, uh, figures that you can place the micro bit on. Um, I always remember in my first conversation talking to the, the CEO at Fennell on this, and we were talking about all the wonderful things you can do with the micro bit, and he said, stop a minute, think, what would a seven-year-old want to do? And I think that's guided me all the way through this. What would I, what would the seven-year-old want to do with this? So it's again about thinking about what they might like to do. And, and again, then this idea of them being innovators and inventors and using the micro bit with the limited pieces of code that they've got to uh, produce something. Um, I worked with a student a few years ago who didn't do much in the classroom. He wasn't one of the high flyers, but brought in his Lego model the next day, which in which he had embedded a micro bit. And the micro bit, as, he, as it bumbled along, the, um, as he dragged the, the Lego uh, model along and it, it vibrated across the floor, the Lego bit, uh, le the micro bit flashed and uh, uh, gave, um, uh, LED responses in terms of, you know, just responding to the shake input. Um, the bit on the right was from a teacher who decided that uh, the students were going to make Harry Potter wands. So they all had to go out, find their favorite stick, and uh, they attached a micro bit to it. They used the shake input. So when you actually shook it uh, or waved your wand, um, it actually flashed out a spell of icons that the students had written, so part of their literacy of the, the Harry Potter spell. The silver foil on the end was an, a development where they were actually using it then with another micro bit that when you touch that micro bit and two pieces of silver foil and you made that circuitry connection, that that micro bit then uh, uh, flashed some other messages. So it was a bit like casting the spell as well. So they'd taken it a little bit further and used the shake input on the micro bit on the wand and then uh, used the, the pin input and making that connection on another micro bit. And the bottom image is, is that very simple loop game. And again, teachers say to me, well, we, we haven't got any money for crocodile clips. So 
a great engineering task is asking students to construct this game just out of um, uh, of silver foil. Yeah, I had to use a bit of tape there as well to hold it down, but we can always find a little bit of sellotape around uh, around the school somewhere. But again, just an engineering task, being able to have the dexterity to make very thin wire and solving those engineering problems um, just to make this simple game and then being able to uh, use the micro bit so the micro bit flashes when they touch it um, and again they have to go back to the beginning this game and you'll see later again how this game evolves into something uh, something else uh, later on and basically actually number two this is where we bring in the idea of variables and we, we've got lots of ways of how we talk about variables um, and this is just to sort of give the students this idea that they can control a variable, that the variable can be used to change something. Um, you can change that variable by using some inputs. So here's the basic piece of code that we would present to students. We'd ask them to predict what they think it does. Um, we'd allow them to experiment with it. Um, for those of you who really know the microbit, um, make code website there's now a feature by which you can distribute that code across a number of um uh to students so they they've got the the code directly they haven't got to make it first that is something i wouldn't talk about with these teachers it, it that's one element that i think we have to be wary of that we need to think about yeah we could do that we could understand that and that aspect is there but as soon as we start drifting into that world, you can start to see the shutters come down, the eyes cloud up because they haven't got an idea, don't know how to do that. And it sounds far too complicated. So again, I'll talk about this later as well, is just be a little wary of letting your enthusiasm, and it's the same for the STEM ambassadors who come for this world. They want to do the best, they've got great ideas, but it's just holding back a little bit. So from this piece of code, we could get students to make a, you know, beat test counters, um, a survey counter, um, a quiz score. Um, and one great thing that I saw in a classroom is that uh, a, a teacher had made a house point uh, with the kids. They'd all made house point counters. So they they had the their or, or class point counters. So whenever the, a child got a reward point or a merit, they went up and pressed a button and they had a run in score on just simple micro bits stuck on the wall of the um, uh, points that had been earned for, for the, those, those class and those house points for that week. Um, again, really simple, but something that the students and the teacher were able to make and get, and get a lot of pleasure from. Um, so just introducing the basic counter, through this code allows them to make even more complicated ideas. So if we take this on further and spice it up, if we now add things like the shake instead of an on button pressed, we can put that onto a skipping rope, uh, onto the handles of a skipping rope. Um, my favorite thing is, is to put it inside a sponge ball. So uh, so every time the sponge ball is kicked, it uh, it's a shake and it adds one to the counter. Now, my when I was talking about this to the teacher, I had to stop myself saying because in my mind, what I would love to have done is made connect made that into a wireless feature. So every time someone kicked the ball and it the counter and the variable changed by one, it broadcasted that through the the, the radio um, feature on the micro bit to a remote micro bit, so the people the students watching. Um, and monitoring the experiment to see how many times they can keep a sponge ball up could actually see it on the side rather than having to open the mic uh, open the ball out and take the microbit out and have a look at the score on it afterwards it's for me that i could do that i know i could do that i could build that and i could build that with my students but again trying to get teachers to understand to do that it's about that little step back and just hold on a little bit let them embed this idea into into the, the, their own teaching and learning before you start giving them other great ideas that may send them may, may undermine the learning that's already taken place um, and an, another one is a, a device that counts how many time a door's opened in a day again could they use the shape uh shake function on that or as, as one teacher one student did it was with using um some silver foil and every time the door opened it rubbed against another piece of silver foil and that counted over uh, and also 
I'm now starting to point them to other com great computing support resources, which is, you know, uh, there's a great microbit project on the on the Raspberry Pi um, project site. So again, just little gentle hand-holding exercises of pushing them to other areas and other uh, um, uh, support uh, and resources for computing in the classroom. And again, here's that game again. This time, we've added a counter into that game. So now we can do it so that every the, 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 the students can see who's won the game by who had the less, least touches on, 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 the, on the metal bar. So again, we've been, they've been able to modify and improve their game by adding now a counter into instead of just a display. So again, we can see some progression in this. Um, I've done a great activity with uh, students in, in, in a school in, in South Wales where the teacher used um, silver foil and the children had to make, they were doing World War II, so they wanted to make unexploded bomb mechanisms. Uh, so the children had to make little devices and it was a little bit like the operation game where they had to pull things out and if they touched the side um the the the, the micro bit flashed and, and the bomb had gone off but again it was another teacher trying to take something very simple like this and integrating it into their history topic and a piece of work um uh, around that so that the students got this idea that you know the job of bomb disposal in world war ii was very dangerous there was lots of engineering and and understanding around science to do that job but again that came from the teachers so it was that's now set in stone as an activity within their curriculum and the third one so the third one is where we start to bring in a, a few more concepts and this is about um uh, basic, uh, just generating random numbers. Um, and the reason we want to do this was to create uh, a very simple dice. And then again, getting students to think about how this works, what would happen if they put 10 in or 100. And again, getting them to experiment with random numbers. Again, this is leading it into uh, to their maths program. But where we really want this to work is to take the students and the teachers into looking at the great resources that are on the Make Code site. So there are tutorials on the Make Code site that, again, the teacher could do when the STEM ambassadors left, or this could be something that the STEM ambassador does with them, and they can run variations on it. So, for example, if they make a dice, yeah, we're used to a traditional dice of with, with one to six, but could we challenge the students to do it so that it creates one to 12, one to 20? Um, could we uh, fix uh, the randomness by, um, you know, so it'll never roll a one or never roll a six? So we could start to just come up with some ideas about um, what the students could do. Then we point them to something like rock, paper, scissors, which is a, a fantastic uh, create a piece of code that sits as a tutorial on the make code site. And this leads them now into that logic, that if statements about if a number is this, then this. And then we can utilize that to start to think about, well, could we make a dice that shows the number of dots rather than just a number? Um, carrying on the Harry Potter theme, uh, a teacher that I worked with who made the wands took um, the rock, paper, scissors code, modified it so that it became a sorting hat um, for, the, you know, to put them in di their different uh, wizarding houses um, or even the ma a magic eight ball with, again, adding more elements and just modifying the code to create a magic eight ball micro bit. So what this activity is trying to do is show them that they can get other help and other support and cr have bits of code which they can take and modify without having to think about that, that themselves. Um, going a little bit further and, and perhaps take, talking about uh, teachers taking these ideas, uh, teachers, will, once they're ex they, often, they will get excited by this stuff and feel then you've got them at a point where they're empowered. So one teacher wanted to make Diwali lamps with their micro bit. So without any hesitation, she went back to recipe one, 
and just got the students to animate and make a sequence of LEDs showing a flicker in flame. Until one child said, could we make them go on when and react to light? Then she was stumped and you could literally see her confidence drain because this child had asked this question. But my advice to her was, well, let's start looking at the websites that you've looked at and with the students, use that question to see if they can solve it. They emailed a couple of people in the Microbit Foundation, they emailed, a, uh, looked on the website and they came up with a solution. And often when teachers lose their confidence because they either they fear that, well, they know students are gonna ask questions that, that perhaps they can't answer. But if we use those great learning skills of, right, let's see if we can find an expert, and the STEM ambassador could be the expert that they relate to. So if a child does ask, how can we uh, get our Divadi lamps to co only come on when it gets dark, then they've got an expert that they've got confidence in. Right, let's go and ask Mrs. So-and-so. She came in and showed us how to do all this stuff with the micro bit. Let's send them an email. So again, you're expanding the students' uh, uh, learning skills, their resilience, their uh, ability to innovate and to ability to ask questions. So what next? I've uploaded the, the, this cookbook, I, I, I've called it, um, uh, from uh, to, to my resource on the CADS website, um, and, and that's available to download there. There's a couple of other resources into it, like there's a template for um, building a little um, uh, cardboard robot um, to put your micro bit in to display a funny faces. There's um, some sheets there for students to mark out and to experiment and create different LED designs. So that's there on the CAS website. Please get in touch with me um, if you are or want to be or, or know of a, a STEM ambassador who'd be interested in trying to deliver this into classrooms. Get in touch if, you, if you're a primary teacher or no primary teacher and, and has no idea how, where to start this stuff. Um, you know, we can, once we get our STEM ambassadors in place, we can start directing them to uh, and linking these people up to uh, get um, them engaged with, with these sort of activities. Um, if you want to know about more about STEM learning and, and the, the NCC program or the STEM ambassador program and work we're doing in that area, in, in, in that field, please get in touch with me or, or, or STEM learning in general. And one thing I need to add on this is if we were about to start this program and we've been supported by the BCS in that if we can get a link a primary school teacher and a STEM ambassador together, and if that primary school teacher dedicates um, two STEM ambassador visits so that the STEM ambassador, we train the STEM ambassador up in this um, way of working and the primary school engages with them and brings the STEM ambassador in, we will give the stat STEM ambassador the, the micro bits, 10 micro bits to work with that class if they haven't got micro bits already, or even if they have. And then if the if they commit to that to those two STEM ambassador visits, the school get to keep those micro bits. So the uh, BCS have, have kindly donated a load of micro bits to be able to do that with this program. But we want to make sure that we're not just giving them out. We want to make sure that the, we build this relationship. So the primary school teacher and the, the school has a legacy. The STEM ambassador is able to to meet the needs of that school, but and and to be a sort of a, a, a long term engagement by which the, the primary school teacher feels they have that support close at hand. 